think that, and we are recording now too. So uh, Kelly, if you would like to uh, step up to the podium and uh, start your work, I will, uh, I think you, can you just take sharing from me? Yeah, I think so. I'm gonna try this. Oh, host is okay. able to, I need you to make me a co-host, I think actually. Okay. Before. Yeah, MSU just upped all of their Zoom security because of a new thing called Zoom bombing I had never heard uh, of. So, yeah, we can't share screens and things like that anymore. Right. Let's see, I think, okay. All right, you should be able to now. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, can you all see my, um, my slides here? Yep, that looks good. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thanks, Titus. So everyone, my name is Kelly Robinson. I'm a pro assistant professor at Michigan State University, uh, and I'm at work in the Quantitative Fisheries Center. You may, uh, some of you may recognize my one of my co-PIs here, Mike Jones, who's been doing a lot of this kind of work that I'm going to talk about for a while now, and worked with um, probably some of you beforehand in 2012 on a similar project. So um, the other co-authors or co-PIs I have on this project are from MSU are Brian Roth and Rick Clark. And so this project is basically trying to update um, what was done back in 2012 with this predator-prey ratio uh, stuff for salmon and trout stocking. Uh, we also have, uh, and by, the, by the way, this is funded specifically by Michigan um, Sea Grant, but this is a project that uh, encompasses all of Lake Michigan. Um, I do not have the chat box up, so if, if someone has a question, you know, feel free to, to let me know or I can pull it up at the end of the talk. Um, but we have three collaborators as well on our project. Uh, Matt Cornis, who's at the Fish and Wildlife Service office in Green Bay. Jory Jonas at Michigan DNR and then Eob Sahaya at uh, Wisconsin DNR. So um, the background for this project is basically uh, most of this this stuff you guys know, um, the recreational fishing for salmon and trout in, in Lake Michigan is of course maintained through stocking. Um, these five species are what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, brown trout, Chinook, coho, uh, lake trout, and, and steelhead. I will refer to them throughout the pre presentation as salmonines. Um, and the stocking decisions of course are aimed to have a sustainable balance of predators and prey because we don't want more mouths to feed than there are uh, there is food available. And currently, the way that's done is through models that account for both um, Chinook and alewife uh, abundance as the, the predator and prey, but not these other species in, in them specifically. So the Lake Michigan Committee, uh, which as most of you know, is made up by um, of, of different agency members from around Lake Michigan, uh, have a new stocking strategy they'd like to implement uh, that incorporates those other species into the predator-prey ratio model. So um, we can use, we have a better sense of what's going on with all the species rather than assuming um, Chinook represent what's happening in the system. And uh, they also wanted to engage stakeholders in the decision making process. So that's where uh, we come in with our project. This is something that um, we're actually just getting the contract for right now. So it's just starting up. Uh, but the goal of it is really just to determine the mix of these different trout and salmon species. That, sh that should be stocked in the Lake Michigan um, that would be most likely to achieve shared objectives of different fishery stakeholders in the lake. So it's this idea of, of working through uh, the process with the stakeholders to understand what they would like to see and then how can we uh, make that happen. And so we have four objectives overall for the project. I'll go through them quickly here and then walk through each of them a little, in a little bit more detail. The first objective is basically just to start the project by engaging with managers and stakeholders from around Lake Michigan to determine the, both the scope and the objectives of an updated, updated Lake Michigan salmonine stocking decision analysis. So this is kind of an updated version of what happened in 2012 um, that resulted in the predator-prey ratio um, in the first place. I, I will also back up and mention that um, I am not in charge of all these objectives and nor have I I've been at Michigan State for that long. I'm in my fourth year here. so. Some of this stuff is, um, is things that I'm telling you about that other people are working on as well. So I'll try to answer your questions if you have them as best as possible. Um, specifically, you know, we're start, the second objective then is incorporating some new information like predator diet information from our co-PI, Dr. Roth, um, some information about wild production for these different species, as well as um, Chinook salmon movements from like Huron into these different models. 
that we have that are, are used now and then use those models to the kind of predict forward in time um, the risks of different stocking strategies that consider the effects of all of the different salmonian species and then develop a model that can help monitor the performance of these policies. Again, I'll get into these in more detail if this isn't um, crystal clear right now. And then finally, bring all of this back to managers and stakeholders to engage in more discussions about different actions we could take um, informed by the models. So um, overall, we're gonna try to do this in this framework called structured decision-making or decision analysis. Uh, the idea is to work through this, this project as a, as a group uh, with the stakeholders. Um, but first, before I get into that, I wanna back up and describe what we mean by a decision. Um, it's actually choosing the action among a set of alternatives that you could, you could choose from. But it's more than having a preference, it's actually you know, making that decision and, and allocating the resources to it. So when we're talking about decision making in this sense, it's you know this irrevocable allocation of resources of funding or um, fish into the water or, or person hours. So that's um, just specifically what we mean. And um, the, making decisions then for things like salmonine stocking or other natural resources problems tend to be difficult um, for a number of reasons and this is why we want to use structured decision making. The first reason is that um, the objectives tend to be complex or contradictory. Um, basically different stakeholders have different perspectives and, and they may disagree on what should be valued in a natural resources decision. Um, the second thing is that we might not know all the actions we could take. We may not have thought um, specifically about certain things that we, we could do, um, just kind of picking from the most obvious choices sometimes. Um, the system dynamics are often poorly known. Uh, there is uncertainty, you know, specifically when we're thinking about salmonian stocking, uh, even understanding exactly how many Chinook or alewife or other species are in the system, of course, re relies on some, you know, confidence interval around that. We don't always know, we don't know how many fish exactly are in the system. So some of these system dynamics might um, hinder us from being able to make the best decisions we could. And then um, we have all these different objectives and values. Trying to make trade-offs among them is, is difficult because it, different people do have different things that they value more or less. So how can we work together to, to make those trade-offs um, in, a, in a better way? So that's um, how we want to try to improve some of this through structured decision making by uh, doing things like incorporating stakeholder values directly into the decision making process, incorporating that uncertainty so we understand how it affects our decisions, um, looking at this comp complexity in a kind of a decomposed manner to try to work through the different pieces, and then make those trade-offs based on um, predicted outcomes while acknowledging constraints we may have um, in the system, either regulations or things like that, or just um, E ecological constraints as well. So um, structured decision making then kind of works through some of this to, to try to achieve a better decision, a more transparent and objective decision. Um, and it, it walks through a series of steps. So um, first off, uh, Keeney, who kind of, who's kind of one of the godfathers of structured decision making, basically calls it a formal application of common sense for situations too complex for the informal use of common sense. So my point there being that this isn't necessarily rocket science, it's just trying to work through something in a more common sense framework. And so uh, this, this kind of wheel here that I'm showing you, uh, let's see if I can get my laser pointer here, uh, works through these different steps to try to, to um, achieve a, an act, a decision that people can basically live with. So the first part is framing the problem where we're trying to work through understanding what things like the scope and the scale and what's triggering it, why are we here, who's the decision maker, who um, are the stakeholders that should be involved, all these things to make sure that everybody's on the same page. A lot of um, natural resources management uh, decisions that are um, made poorly are traced back to people just not really being on the same page about what problem they're actually working on. Um, so then after we frame the problem, this is where we get into this idea that it's values-based. We first try to understand uh, stakeholders' values and objectives um, what do they want to achieve to, to solve the problem? And then we get into these, the actions or alternatives. So we're trying to first say, what do you want to get out of this? And then what are the actions that could help us to achieve those objectives? Then finally, we work into the consequences stage where we get into more of this, this modeling um, part where we're making predictions about how each action might help us to achieve our objectives. And then um, we go through and try to identify a preferred alternative by making some trade-offs because we 
understand that typically in natural resources management decisions, um, there's not going to be one action we could take that's going to best achieve everyone's objectives. But what can we, uh, what can we trade off against to, to understand what the, the preferred action could be? And so again, the five core elements that we would like to work with folks to, to in this project are first to make the right decision problem, the, the PR, um, the O is the objectives, describing those desired outcomes. Uh, the alternatives phase is considering any reasonable action that could achieve the outcomes. Consequences is describing the, that achievement of objectives through things like modeling and, and gathering data and expert elicitation. And then finally making trade-offs to evaluate different levels of achievement on those different objectives. So it's a really quick and dirty description of structured decision making, but this is kind of how we want to work through this project with um, groups uh, or with the group uh, for the, the Salmonian stocking pro problem. And um, so the first component of this that I think makes it useful for something like this is that we're focusing on people's values and objectives that can help us drive the rest of the analysis so that we're trying to, you know, kind of find solutions that, that best achieve those objectives which is in contrast to how we usually make decisions when we just we say, I've got a problem, what am I gonna do about it? And then we're gonna be working through problem decomposition. Um, if I, when I teach a class about this, I usually use like a uh, MSU basketball as an example or something where you're trying to learn a skill and you have to break the problem into its component parts and then complete those analyses and then recompose it to make the decision. So um, getting back to the objectives that we have for this project, um, the first step in this project basically is to engage stakeholders in this in a workshop where we would go through these first, you know, three um, steps of the process, the problem, the objectives, and the alternatives, uh, trying to, to list those different um, values that people have, think about the different actions we could take, whether they're stocking strategies or kind of, you know, points where you may need to change, make changes to what's happening if we see certain things uh, occurring in the ecosystem. And then also to brief stakeholders on the kind of current state of the system and the models currently used. Uh, so we can um, update everyone on that. And then the second objective would um, be to start gathering the data that's necessary for the models that we would use in this process. So for instance, um, I mentioned before, Brian Roth, one of the uh, other professors from MSU on this, this grant, has a lot of work on, on predator diets in um, different predators in Lake Michigan. So a lot of the information that he's gathering will help us to understand more what each of these different species is consuming. We also um, would gather more input data for the models. Uh, there's a lot of these models haven't been updated for a while in terms of um, like this, the, just the harvest data and things like that. Um, we also have more information about how Chinook seem to be moving between Lakes uh, Michigan and Huron. And then um, we would update our stock assessment models for all of these species. Uh, and the stock assessment models basically are the models that provide us with an understanding of how many fish are in the, the system right now. And so an example of some of those data that we can use to update is this work that um, Rick Clark, one of our other co-PIs, has been working on for a while, um, looking at how Chinook have been moving from Lake Huron to Lake Michigan, specifically after the, um, the alewife in Lake Huron crashed. So, if you look at this graph, what we're showing you is um, over time how uh, many uh, alewife in the dotted line there were in Lake Huron. So you can see this crash that occurred in the early 2000s. And concurrent with that, it looks like the percentage of um, stocked Chinook in Lake Huron that moved into Lake Michigan to feed really um, increased a lot over, over that same time frame. So we can see that, you know, we, we may need to account for some of the, the fish coming into to Lake Michigan from Lake Huron to consume those same um, alewife. And so that, that's kind of a, a just an idea of the kinds of things we'd like to incorporate into the models. Then with the third objective, we'd actually want to upgrade these models and help us to evaluate the consequences again, back to the SDM process, um, evaluate and make predictions about how different um, stocking strategies would influence the, the objectives of the stakeholders that have been defined. Again, this would um, be using the guidance from the, those workshops to help us to understand what stakeholders want and then try to figure out how to model that and make predictions about it. And this would, it would be two different models, both the stock assessment and a forecasting model. Uh, so the stock assessment model um, provides us with an understanding of, of the historical population size. So 
Uh, we take historical data from these different species, like harvests, um, how many were stocked, what's, natural what's happening with natural recruitment, um, what they're consuming, um, and different prey fish surveys to try to reconstruct the population kind of size and dynamics over time. Um, and we can use that information to, to get this multi-species predator-prey ratio. So I, I alluded to that at the beginning. This is basically just looking at what's the ratio of all these different species, uh, these five salmonine species to alewife biomass. And we can use that as kind of an indicator of, of whether we're doing the, they're doing well or poorly in terms of um, making that ratio the best for the amount of food that's in the food that's in Lake Michigan. Um, so that's the stock assessment side. So we can take that stock assessment information, which is giving us, you know, what's happening now in the lake and use it to make predictions forward in time with a forecasting model. And so the idea here is basically to say, if we were to do alternative one, how would we predict that to influence the different things that, that stakeholders care about? What about alternative two? So it's just trying to kind of predict forward in time how different stocking strategies would affect all five of those species that we can look at in the future what the multi-species predator-prey ratio would be, uh, what future population sizes and prey consumption might be as well. Um, and we can measure these outcomes again in terms of, of what the stakeholders have um, described in terms of what they'd like to see for the system. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick example of the updated data we could use for lake trout. And this is the part where um, this is not my this is not my expertise per se. This is what Rick's been working on. So um, if you have questions about it, I'm happy to try to answer them or to find you an answer if I don't have it. So um, basically, for many years, the, the, the stock assessment model has basically modeled um, this kind of darker blue region of the lake and assumed then that what's happening in that part of the lake can be extrapolated out to the rest of the lake. So we assume that the entire lake had the same population density of lake trout. But the new model that Rick has been working on is trying to estimate abundance in these regional areas instead. So we get a kind of a better snapshot of what's happening in the population. And so um, I'm gonna show you a few slides of graphs that kind of compare these two different models. Um, so we have over here um, from over time and then the number of uh, age six plus lake trout in the system. So the, the orange line is providing you with information from the old lake trout model that modeled part of the lake and then extrapolated out. You can also see that after about 2008 there aren't, they haven't had updated data to, to keep updating the model so they've kind of just assumed a steady state. Um, the new model then is actually in, suggesting that there are more lake trout in the system than the old model had suggested. Um, so what that means could mean is that they could be consuming more alewife in the system, right? So what Rick also looked at was trying to find backwards in time kind of from different reports and, and published papers and things like that, um, what proportion of the lake trout diet was um, alewife and um, more recently around goby. So this graph is showing you the proportion, so from 0% basically to 100%. Back in the 80s, you can see that pretty much everything they ate was alewives, but that has been seemingly declining in recent years. Um, this orange line is just other fish species, and then the green line, importantly, is round goby. So they seem to be trading off some of their, their consumption of alewife for round gobies in more recent years. And again, um, Dr. Roth is going to be updating some of this even further. But what that could mean is that um, if we look at kind of first consumption of just all fish by lake trout, because we were predicting that there are more fish in the system than we thought they, the consumption is probably increasing and that could cause problems with alewife. But what Rick is finding is that um, the proportion of, of that total consumption that's alewives is increasing, but it's also um, not increasing as much as it could because round gobies are making up more of the proportion of that diet. Uh, again, I am happy to answer questions about this if I'm not making sense later. But so the take home is basically that, you know, lake trout are consuming more fish recently because there are more lake trout, but it's buffered some by the consumption of round gobies and also the fact that they aren't, the number of, of lake trout out there doesn't account for but so much of the total consumption of alewives anyway because of all the other species. So they're about, they consume about 20% of the alewives in the system. Uh, so this again is all based on stuff that Rick's still working on. It's still kind of under, um, he's still tweaking the models and things, but so it's a, a kind of a hot off the press information for you there. 
about lake trout. And so we'd like to do something similar with other species of, of um, salmonids in the, the lake as well. So that brings me then to the last objective where we would take all this information that I've just described to you really quickly and bring it back to the stakeholders in a second workshop to evaluate those consequences and trade-offs. So show you kind of how we've built these models, what they're saying, how can we make trade-offs based on what we're predicting from these updated models. Um, the goal then is to build agreement on a management procedure for um, decision-making for salmonid stocking in Lake Michigan that can provide kind of decision aiding capabilities for the Lake Michigan committee that's informed by stakeholders. And I use this term decision aiding because of course um, the agencies around the lake that are represented by Lake, lake Michigan committee members are who ultimately makes those stocking decisions, but they um, are interested in having the stakeholder guided decision aiding process for them to understand better what stakeholders want and how we could achieve that. And so um, I mentioned before, this is similar to what happened in 2012. Some of the things that we have updates on are, of course, the diet data that Brian is working on. Uh, we have this lake-wide lake, lake trout information and um, a better understanding of that influence of Chinook salmon from Lake Huron on Lake Michigan alewife. So that's kind of part of the, the impetus for this and also this idea that we'd like to incorporate all of the species in this um, process. So the project timeline, of course, is pretty dependent on global events right now. We'd like to have our first structured decision-making workshop in the late summer, early fall, um, where we could go through those first three steps and then concurrently with that, start collecting those, those data that we would need to incorporate into the models. Then once we've had the workshop that can provide us with the information about how to move forward with upgrading the models and have that final workshop, kind of a, a year and a half or two years later. Obviously, um, getting started on this will be, uh, like I said, dependent on other things, uh, but that's kind of the, the idea for the timeline right now. And so I know I went through this pretty quickly. Um, we are hoping to, to get some folks from all of the different states around Lake Michigan to join us in this workshop. Uh, ideally, a good group would be 25 or 30 people. So. Um, you know, we're going to be working to, to try to find some folks that, that might be interested that we think would, would, um, would be a good uh, representative of the different stakeholder groups that we have around the lake. I've got my email address here. I don't have, obviously can't hand you any of my cards, of which I have about 10,000 <laughs> that I never hand out. Um, so feel free to email me if you have any um, interest in this or if you have questions, and I'm happy to answer questions now if there's time. All right, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, we don't, I don't see any, uh, no questions in the chat box. Titus my, hand, Titus, my hand's up. But Bob, Bob Winsack, your hand is up. Thank you. You're unmuted. I am unmuted, thank you. Uh, Kelly, yes. are you working with Dr. Medinjin and Dr. Warner on their uh, forward studies that they do every year that they've been doing since 1965? Um, yeah, we, they're not co-PIs or anything on the project, but we are, actually I gave, when I gave the same presentation at the Michigan um, meeting, I went right after Dr. Warner, so um, yeah. They're part, of, they're part of Sea Grant Michigan as well as UW Michigan, which I know that you know, you're green, they're a different color, and it's like I get to put oh, yeah. the thing. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is we, we have a resource here that we're trying to yeah. manage the resource, and we, the last thing we want to do is have this resource go to hell. Agreed, yeah. Yeah, I know for sure we're, we'll be working to gather the, those sorts of data will be really important for what we're, we're working on as far as kind of predicting out, you know, what's going to happen with alewife as well as the, the fish that are feeding on them. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Jerry, you got your hand up. All right. Yeah. Uh, quick, I guess two questions for you, uh, Carrie. One would be... Um, Will the other states' uh, universities be involved in this uh, uh, study as well, or, or this? Uh... Yeah, um, that's a good question. So we do have um, Dan O'Keefe from Michigan Sea Grant is working with us, and then we have um, someone whose name escapes me right now from the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, who's helping us out as well. So yeah, we have um, kind of the the Sea Grant Extension folks from from around the lake to help us. 
Okay. Also, I guess my concern would be is I like hopefully Wisconsin would be somewhat involved in it. Um, one concern that I have with your with this where it's going, and and I mm -hmm. get maybe is this are these studies going to be just done on uh, the Michigan side, or is this going to be no. uh, statewide or lakewide? Yeah, or? The, the idea is lakewide, so that's why I'm trying to kind of talk to everyone around the lake about it because we'd like to have representation from the entire lake. It's it's funded by Michigan Sea Grant, but that's as far as the the strict Michigan connection goes. Is have, we'd like to have everyone represented. Okay, I definitely will be emailing you. I definitely would be like, okay. like be involved in this as Great, well. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Jim. Hey, Titus. Yeah, just a question regarding the workshop. Is this for professionals and scientists? Are you looking for input from, you know, a, um, an angler? You know, yes. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And that's a very good question. No, that specifically, we'd like to have mostly anglers and those that are using the resource in the room. Um, this is the opportunity to get the people that um, are the true stakeholders and, and resource users to get, give us their objectives. I'm sorry if that was, I didn't make that clear at the beginning. Yeah, this is um, mostly those folks. We might have some managers there for, you know, to see what's happening. But yeah, these are the people that we would like to get their objectives. Okay, and could you put your email address back up on the screen, please? Oh yeah, it should still be up there, but um, I, I blocked it with the okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Yep. Got my hand up again, Titus. Okay, Bob. I just got a question for Kelly. Sure. Um, we. We're operating in extraordinary times right now. The coronavirus is everybody's yeah. sitting on the edge of their chair. Um, we're being told charter captains can't fish. We're being told we can't fish and we can't keep six feet staff separation. Mm -hmm. It's gonna have an impact on what we harvest this year at this point in time. Yeah. Um, how, how are you gonna treat that in your study or you know, I mean, like everything else, everything else is on hold, but your study seems to be going forward, but we're not going forward. So it's yeah, no, a big impact. Thanks. It's a very good question. Uh, I appreciate it. I don't have a straight answer for you right now because I haven't, um, yeah, everything's been triaged at the moment. So I haven't really thought too hard about how we're going to incorporate those things, but I think that they're going to be, yeah, it's going to be a huge difference as far as what's harvested and what, um, what goes into the models. I mean, I, I don't really have a, a, a straight answer for you right now. It's certainly something we're going to have to consider. And, you know, it, the timeline that I gave you is, of course, potentially optimistic mm -hmm. at this point. Um, C Grant, you know, has, of course, provided us with the idea that they're going to help support us as we move forward if we need to, if things can't move on time. So, um, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of uncertainties there. I don't, I, I like to deal with uncertainties in my career, but this is not really it, <laughs> if you will. For I me. understand. To yeah, but that's, that's a good question. I, I appreciate it. Take it one step further, Kelly. Yeah. I've asked from the Wisconsin side why we were not involved in the stomach content study that uh, Matt uh -huh. and the people of Michigan have been, been producing. And the answer is, well, we can be, but we have to find a way to get the stomachs shipped back to Michigan. Oh, um, yeah. okay. I mean, we catch a lot of fish on our side of the lake. Um, we'd like to be part of the study to see what the fish really are eating. Is it really mm -hmm. as bad as we think it is or not? But unfortunately, there's no easy way to do it. Well, I, um, you said you were going to email me. Or email, if you email me, I will um, forward that, that question to, to Brian. So I'm not um, part of that study, but I know he's always looking for more stomachs and, you know, yeah. Obviously, well, like we said, can't travel. We're not even allowed to leave the state right now, but um, and probably most people aren't. <laughs> but, right. well, one of the uh, things that Cheryl and I have discussed is the fact that we have freezers at Racine, Milwaukee, Port mm -hmm. Washington, and I think Kenosha. And we could actually ask our members of our fishing clubs to provide tied off uh, entrance and exit uh, points of the yeah. contents, put them in the freezer if there were some way to get them there. Cheryl and I are kind of like going, what's the next step? Okay. Well, yeah, I think Brian would be really interested in trying to coordinate that. And, um, 
he's always looking for more stomachs and certainly isn't um, you know, yeah, focused I, I on will issues. Add, I will add too that I, you know, uh, you know, really I've, I've talked with them about this and how we can make it work. And I think if we can use that network of freezers and mm -hmm. ideally I was going to have an intern this summer uh, who could help with that, uh, you know, maybe collecting stomachs or, uh, you know, picking those up from the freezers. And right now we're, we're moving ahead with hiring, but whether or not or when they're actually going to be able to get out, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that. But hopefully we would like to get more, more stomachs from this side of the lake. Yeah. I mean, when Matt gave us his presentation in December up at the Federation meeting, a lot of us were astounded at the amount of other forage that some of the fish are eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's impressive. I mean, it, and it stinks the high heaven down from my office the whole time <laughs> when they're working on it. But they've got a lot of stuff that they're finding in their stomach. It's impressive. Nothing major. Make, we'll make it smell like 500 East Greenfield, Greenfield Avenue for all those people from the DNR that work over at the Freshwater Institute in Milwaukee. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. see rich yes um rich jones here um i'm curious is the stakeholders meeting going to be on the weekend so uh, mm -hmm. yeah i think that would be the the idea we try to make it more accessible to the folks that have that are stakeholders but have other things that they do during the week so um again we haven't um planned out exactly you know the, the logistics of that initially we had thought it might be easier to have you know kind of a workshop on one side of the lake and a workshop on the other but oh, my dog is creeping in the room here sorry <laughs> but I think the idea now is maybe to have one large workshop um, probably on a weekend but again you know as we plan this as folks that are interested we'll keep updated and, and do you know doodle polls and things like that thank you mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, thank you, Kelly, for, uh, you know, being able to uh, participate remotely. I think that's, you know, you you were probably going to be remote either way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess it's, we are all remote it's a now, so. equalizer for me there. Yep. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Yep, and we, I will, uh, you know, definitely share your, your contact info uh, with everybody on our list, and uh, um, I'm sure you'll hear from some people. Um, Brad, let's uh, switch up to you now. All right, if you're talking, Brad, we can't hear you. And there you go. How about now? Yeah, I just unmuted you. So go ahead. All right. Thanks for having me, Titus, and uh, giving everybody an update where we are with the uh, Charter Pro program that we've been working on for quite a few months with a smaller set of stakeholders over time. And we want to take this opportunity to inform members of the Fisheries Forum uh, the particulars of it and take comment, input, uh, suggestions, et cetera. So really the basics for the charitable program I have listed there, it's really threefold, uh, gather information, education, and really promoting a dialogue uh, between fisheries, stakeholders, and communication of current issues are the, the main purpose of the, the four parts to this charitable program as that we've been working on. The four parts, uh, there are four parts to the program. You can see there, we've got the electronic guide reporting, an education day, we're gonna be riding along with charter boats, and then an alewife survey are the four components of this charter boat program. The first part is uh, electronic guide reporting. We are working internally right now on seeing what we can do about reporting for regular guides. These are guides that have an inland guide license, 
and in particular guide quite a bit on the Bay of Green Bay through the ice. Right now, we don't have the statutory nor rulemaking authority to enforce this reporting. So we have an internal team to determine how can we make that happen where they're basically on the same level and playing field as the charter boat captains report their information to us as we are interested in, in particular, the whitefish withdrawal during the ice season on Green Bay. Uh, so that's that's ongoing. It's going to take a little bit of work because there's probably going to be code and statute changes, and that's going to have to wind its way through the legislature to make that happen. We're also at least looking at and uh, investigating electronic reporting. We've been talking about this for quite a while. Um, we're, we're sort of just getting estimates that that's, at this point, of which they're they're fairly expensive to uh, employ a web-based and then with uh, applications on your smartphones for reporting both charter and guide information. So that's sort of in its infancy as we move along. And then as part of that, we wanted to uh, update the charter report form in two uh, small but fairly significant uh, ways. One is to add a, a boat name or registration, state registration column, so that uh, we know what boat uh, charter captain could be on for that day. And then we added a biological uh, column so that we can start to gather information from the fleet in terms of, of the Chinook salmon that are caught, how many uh, have eclipsed at a post. And that, of course, that will be uh, useful to compare that uh, percent of wild or percent of stocked fish compared to other data points that we get in the lake. The second part is an education day, and you can see that really is a, a idea or a thought where the there'd be exchange of information between the charter boat industry and key federal and state politicians, as well as key DNR staff, just to inform uh, us and and the politicians about about the charter boat industry, what's going on, concerns, how they operate, etc. This will be uh, primarily uh, done by the Lakeshore Business Association is gonna be organize this event. And the idea would be to start sometime in 2020 where we would have a day uh, on the lake. I don't know if it's gonna be, it'll probably be one day. I don't know if it'll be in a variety of ports. Uh, the Lakeshore Business Association is still working on that. I don't have a real update other than uh, that's, that's what we, they thought they were gonna do. And we'll see how that pans out as we move along through the rest of this season. Hey Brad. Yeah. Bob here. Uh, who's going to be invited to this, seen as the LBMA uh, or whatever they are, uh, is associated with running this? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it should be open to everybody in the uh, Great Lakes uh, sport fishing side. Okay, I'll uh, pass that on. I mean, I've got charter guys that are part of my club that don't necessarily mean they agree with the uh, WLBA. Sure. And okay. they, could, they could add to it as much as anyone else. All right, I will uh, I'll take that forward. Thank you, sir. The third part to the charter boat program is uh, riding charter boats by fishery staff. And you can see there it would be to, again, educate fishery staff about charter business perspectives. And then if we would have uh, different ways to report information, that then we would be able to assist if it got to that point uh, with it entering this data and be sort of a help to make sure whatever system we put in place would be uh, a seamless transition to that. Uh, right now, we have, we're going to be riding uh, one charter boat per month, uh, per county in the summer months. And if, it, if it's fully utilized, that'll be about 27 trips. We're working with the, the Lakeshore Business Association again, who is going to be providing a captain list, a proof of insurance and a, co a Coast Guard inspection report and then we're going to be filling out available dates where staff could potentially be on the boat. And the charter captain would then look at this calendar and determine that, yes, I have room for a staff person on board a particular day. And then we would accomplish the uh, ride along. We have a calendar, as you can see, it's a Google calendar that's accessible. And you can see we have some of the dates filled in here for June as an example. And you can see it's basically a county followed by a staff name. And then there's a contact number there. So we, the, the captains know 
what counties available and who would be coming and then make the contact on Sunday. And it would start obviously pending our, our little friendly virus. The idea would be started this year, June of 2020. And lastly, we are looking to do a, a little bit of alewife survey and to increase our in, information and knowledge on these forage fish, forage fish. And essentially it's to be completing a plan that would look at alewife age frequency in selected Lake Michigan ports. And the plan right now is to sample two ports, Kenosha and Kiwani. We would spend one day per port sampling. Our idea would be to capture 10 fish per 20 millimeter size increments from, that should say 80 to 200 millimeters, and see what we are in terms of how old the fish and what's the length age frequency of alewives in these two different ports. Uh, we would be starting in May, June of 2020 with the help of, of local staff to kind of zero in on when would we be coming there to sample. Likely sampling event would be through our large boat electrofishing equipment. And that's the, the four parts of the program I wanted to uh, inform you of today. At this point, I can answer any questions. I have my hand up, Titus. All right, yeah, I wasn't sure if you put it down. I put it down, put it back up. Okay. I just have a question for Brad. Brad, what happens if you don't meet your, uh, you know, you're looking at Kenosha, Kenosha is one of the ports where in the fall, Dr. Medengen and uh, Dr. Warner cannot find uh, alewives. Um, what happens if you can't find any during the time of your study? I think in May, and from what I understand and, and what we know about the biology of alewife, I think we're pretty confident in May and June with keeping, keeping in touch with the locals in each one of those harbors that will be hitting, you know, Buying really crazy weather events, you know, okay. we'll be hitting the peak time these alewives are in shore and harbors and time our, our right. plan accordingly to hit that day. I but, stand, uh, thank you. I stand corrected. That's during spawning time and you should find some samples. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jerry. Hi, Brad. Hey. Question for you with the uh, electronic reporting uh, for the guide. Is that strictly up in the Bay of Green Bay that reporting is going to be, or is that going to be for anybody that possesses a guide license? Yeah, I think that's up for debate right now. We're, we're quite a ways away from it, Jerry, just because we've got to determine what has to change as far as the language and the code, and it has to wind its way through you know, so many layers of approval um, and what it would look like as far as would it be guides on the Great Lakes? Would it just be for ice fishing season? That's undetermined at this point. Okay, very good, thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Titus. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Um, okay, Brad, before you go, um, I think I do have a question here. Um, I think about, Chris, is this about the, the alewife sampling? Um, are you, are there, are you, would you consider other ports potentially receiving for that uh, alewife sampling? Or are you locked into uh, Kenosha and Kewanee? Not necessarily. Uh, we are probably due to staff and time going to do two ports, um, but we're not necessarily locked into any anyone at this point. But I don't think I don't think there's a, a reason to think that the age length frequency in Racine is going to differ than Kenosha since they're right next to each other. But uh, certainly. Whether this is a, a one year ongoing event, um, that is, that's to be determined as well. So there's other opportunities potentially in subsequent years. 
All right, and then the, the ride-alongs are all the counties. Do you have specific ports on those or it would be any port within the county or how would that work? Yeah, right now we essentially have staff have uh, put on the calendar the counties that they would be able to go to and, and jump on a boat that goes from Kenosha to Marinette. Uh, the idea is to accomplish a ride on a charter boat in each county for each month. So, uh, for example, once we would ride in Ozaki County, June the 6th, then we would notify that, okay, Ozaki's covered, then we'd concentrate or, or hope we'd get calls from Sheboygan or Marinette or Kenosha for June and, and try and sample each one of the nine counties once per month. But it, yeah, it could be, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're in Two Rivers or Manitowoc or mm -hmm. Sheboygan or Cleveland, it doesn't matter, just out of that county. Okay. All right, thanks, Brad. Yep. Hey, Brad. Yep. Brad, I would definitely, this is Jerry again, I would, uh, uh, one of the days in June, I have, we could go on our charter boat as well if you're looking, so. I yeah, there's a, I think once the, once we get the lists, uh, I think they're, the idea would be to get the, the list of participating captains in early May, run that through our safety personnel, and then we would have to send out, uh, you know, finalize instructions on how this will all work to who's ever going to participate in the program. All right, thanks, Brad. Very uh, good. Scott, I think you can, uh, you ready? Yeah, I'm here, so I'm, you'll have to coach me along here a little bit than what I have to do. I've got my presentation open. Do you have, do you? Uh, yeah, if you, if you start it, uh, there is a share screen button on the bottom. Okay. It's green. If you hit that, yep. you can select your presentation. Gotcha. Uh, okay, somebody's still sharing apparently. It says you cannot start screen share while other participant is sharing. Okay. Let's see if I can. That's Brad. Let's see. This will stop. Yes. And. Can you just uh, go through that or just force it to stop? Is that an option? Me? Yeah. If you hit share. It just gives me, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay. And then I hit okay. Um, just. Unless, can you see my presentation up right now? Uh, we can still see Brad's. Uh, background. Brad, can you uh, go down to share screen, click that and tell it to stop sharing screen or it may be on the top, top of your screen. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, for some reason I lost my main large screen here. Can you, can you dock me from the call so I can come back in? Okay, let me see more. <laughs> I'm going to remove you, Brad. Okay. Oh, wait. Stop sharing. Okay. There, we go. there was a stop sharing. Yeah, I was locked. I couldn't see the big screen, so that's I'm glad you could do that. All right, Scott. Now give it a try. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see the kind of the whole view. There we go. Okay. Okay, all set? Yep. All right. So I'm going to present. Um, the model results from the two newly developed stock assessment models for Lake Whitefish and Wisconsin waters of Lake Michigan. Um, and this was presented to the um, Commercial Fish Board a um, month and a half ago or so. Um, I guess maybe I might want to wait till the end if there's questions just to kind of get through the whole thing. I'm sure that's where the questions will come anyway. So at any rate, um, Basically, the, the impetus for this was, you know, was to better describe the population dynamics of Lake Whitefish in Wisconsin waters of Lake Michigan. Historically, it had always been treated as one stock, 
Um, that has not been the case for quite some time. Um, so to better um, manage the populations or the stocks, um, it was necessary to take all the data and split them in half. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here uh, shortly here. So the data that go into this, these are the data that go into the model. Um, for the Lake Michigan model, um, or for the Green Bay model, it's 2007 to 2018, and the Lake Michigan model, 1995 to 2018. Now, <clears throat> the Green Bay data are much more limited, as you can see, and, and 2007, 2008 was around the advent of the, of the um, uh, recreational fishery out there, and also around the time when the populations really increased and the catches in the commercial uh, fishery increased as well. It's not to say there hasn't been a Green Bay commercial fishery, but um, it, it certainly went through a, a period of, of decline into the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, um, it's a statistical catch at age model. So the, um, we age the fish, enter the information based on age compositions. Uh, Green Bay goes out to 20 years. Lake Michigan goes out to 25 years. So there's a, a, a distinct difference between um, the age composition, the age structure between these two bodies of water um, at this moment. Um, weighted age information, length of age information go into this. Um, much of this information is collected from the commercial fishery, uh, but we also use some information from our uh, fishery independent from our, our surveys. Uh, maturity schedule, which is j just um, how many fish are, how many females are mature at a certain age, what the percentage is. So as an example, you may, and that's changed considerably with the slowing of growth over time, but it's now uh, typically around six or seven is when they start to enter um, the, their reproductive um, status. So, you know, there, it typically takes somewhere up to nine or 10 years for, for us to get full maturation in these fish. Well, a little less, maybe eight or nine years. Um, and then again, we've got trap net data. So we've got, we model the different fisheries that are out there, the trap net, the gill net, the recreational fisheries. So most of the data that are listed next here are, are um, uh, commercial data that are reported bi-weekly um, by the commercial fishermen um, for the trap nets and the gill nets. And then the recreational data. So again, that goes back to around 2008 um, it took us some, a little time to get um, some of the biological sampling going on, but now we've, we've got a really good system for, for collecting biological data from the recreational fishery. And then finally, there's a young of the year index survey for Green Bay. And so the, the data that typically go into these models are, are um, sourced from the commercial fishery because that's where most of the fishing uh, comes, at least for all the other models in Lake Michigan. And uh, to my knowledge, none of them have uh, a survey, something from the, an independent survey that goes directly into their models. And we were able, because of the fact that we've got a, um, what Tammy does with Yellow Perch and Green Bay in August, um, and the bycatch of whitefish has been a very good index of, of recruitment in Green Bay. Um, not the case on Lake Michigan, but the case on Green Bay. So we're able to use the Young of the Year Index survey data as an input into this model, which is, is really nice to be able to do. Okay, so the assessment models themselves, they're age structured. Um, up in the upper hand, left hand, you have recruitment, so the number of fish coming into the population, and then each individual age is modeled. So all, and it, and these models start at age three and they go out to 20 and 25 years. Um, and then <clears throat> what comes out of those is taken out of those fish uh, uh, out of those ages are, is natural mortality and fishing mortality so essentially you're modeling the mortality um, and the extractions from these uh, from these ages and that's uh, indicated by the harvest data so our assessment model asks what combination of recruitment mortality best explain these data and then we can generate fish abundance. So, and I have to mention that um, there's a lot of help from Ted Truscott and Eob, um, our 
research, our research branch, and then Ted Trust with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and we support these new models. So the Green Bay model results. Um, something here. Okay. Um, so what you're seeing here is the estimated uh, whitefish biomass for Green Bay. So this is in pounds. And the, the solid line on the top is the total uh, biomass. So that's including all fish, all white fish down to age three. And then the dotted line is spawning stock. So essentially right now we're looking at somewhere around 37 uh, million pounds of whitefish uh, spawning stock in Green Bay, which is highly, highly impressive. Um, you can see again back in 2007 is, is when it started out. So um, unfortunately, this model is a little bit limited by the number of years data. It would be nice to get uh, a number of years previous to this into this model, but um, we're fortunate to have what we've got now, and, and each year we'll be able to refine this model. <clears throat> um, these are the harvest data from, from uh, Green Bay for gillnet, uh, the lighter gray, recreational, the dark gray, and then the trap net fishery. So in recent years, you're talking about eight, 900,000 pounds of fish being taken out, but you can see how, how the recreational fishery really has, has increased over time. And you know, in some years, it approaches the, the harvest that's taken out from the, uh, the trap, or yeah, the trap and the gillnet fisheries, so basically from a commercial fishery. Um, next slide is we're going to look at um, kind of a few data points here, um, how they follow up. This is effort for the recreational fishery on the top, and as you can see, um, starting out in 2007, when there was just a trivial, trivial amount of, of effort out there to what we've got now. Um, I mean, whatever that comes out to be, 20, uh, 200,000 hours essentially of recreational effort, which is, is pretty impressive for an ice fisher. And you have to keep in mind, this is limited to the ice fishery. So some years we've got more ice and, and obviously some years less, but typically it's half of January, February and March, and then uh, and, and often not all of March um, as well. Um, the trap net and the gill net, uh, effort kind of go in different directions. The trap net effort, and we have to keep in mind that it, it doesn't seem to have changed. It's changed somewhat, even though it, it doesn't look like an awful lot. But if you're looking and going from around, well, 12, yeah, 1200 trap net lifts up to 1500 or so, it's still an appreciable increase. Um, but because the quota is limited in the southern part of Green Bay, um, and that's where most of the fishing occurs, most of the effort occurs, or at least a lot of it, um, you're not going to register a huge increase in, in effort, basically, because of, of the quota limitations in that zone. Um, and I can, didn't really get into those details of how the zone quotas are, are managed, but um, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, million, and then, but gillnet itself has, has gone down considerably over the years, um, much more uh, significant in the 90s and early 2000s and for a variety of reasons um, most of them catchability because of the water clarity the changes in um, uh, uh, as a result of the invasive species um, mussels and whatnot um, could offer increases gillnet is just not as effective as it used to be and there's fewer people in the fishery as well doing it um, so catch per effort um, the top and the gill net has, has stayed relatively consistent over time. Um, recreational fishery has gone up a bit um, and the trap net catch per effort, as you can see, has gone up. So we looked at it earlier in the last slide that the, the number of effort or the amount of effort for the trap net hadn't gone up considerably, but catch per effort from 2007 to, to uh, 2018 increased from about uh, 300 to 400 pounds per lift, so you know you're talking a good, a good increase. Uh, and again, this is a, a quota, con very tightly quota controlled in the, the southern part of Green Bay. Um, this slide was, is looking at um, some model data now. 
So the other data there were just data inputs um, that go into uh, into design uh, the model structure. Um, this is showing the difference between the observed, so the ages that we provide the model, the average age, and then the red is the predicted amount. So the, the uh, model essentially tries to fit those data that, that we input into there as, as best it can. And you can see it does relatively well, but when there's a, a big jump here and there, it doesn't track particularly well. This is a very difficult thing of, of all the things that are that uh, model uh, predicts. Age composition is a very difficult thing because there's a, a lot of error associated with it. There's a lot of variation um, in uh, age. So there's a, you can have a, a fish that's seven years old, for example, that sometimes will be enter, starting to enter the fishery at 16 or 17 years old, but then some of them aren't, are upwards of 19 or 20 inches. So essentially there's, there's a big difference between um, as the fish get older, what, um, essentially the size of that fish. Um, okay, so that is, that was all everything for Green Bay. Now I'm gonna go into, and, and I didn't provide all the model results. These are just some of the more um, interesting and useful data that go into the model um, to describe into the models. So now we start out and pretty much in the same, um, same rotation here of slides, but now we're talking about just Lake Michigan. So essentially from uh, the northern part of Door County on south. Um, you can see here that the during the 90s, um, early 2000s is when we had the big population boom and large recruitment events coming from Lake, all parts of Lake Michigan. Um, however, around the mid 2000s, it declined um, considerably. And this has been a big concern and, and has been uh, the reason for a, a lot of uh, effort to look at issues with recruitment of Lake Whitefish in Lake Michigan, because it's not behaving the way Green Bay is. Green Bay is somewhat of an anomaly in uh, production of Lake Whitefish in, in Lake Michigan at this point. Um, we are seeing a little bit of an uptick the last few years, which is reassuring. Um, however, we've, we've dropped considerably um, over the years and what's somewhat more encouraging to me as well as you can see how the the bands separate fairly well between the total biomass and the spawning stock biomass at times but during those years of very limited production um, they get pretty close together um, again the harvest graph here so this is much uh, more simplified um, than Green Bay where you've just got the gill and the trap net fishery. Um, the last couple of years harvesting around uh, around six to seven hundred thousand pounds from Lake Michigan. Um, a lot of this is coming from the southern part from zone three which is Algoma on south. The, the fishery that historically was the backbone which is the, the, the part of zone two in Lake Michigan from Algoma up to the tip of Door County um, really is now limited to a fall fishery when the fish come back to spawn. Um, what's not depicted here is the trawl fishery uh, because that was such a, a new fishery. Um, what I chose to do with the few years data we had in there was to roll it into the trap net data. So this does include the trawl fishery that's occurring out of the Manitowoc Two Rivers area. Um, however, I um, rolled it into the trap net harvest for the time being, but after, uh, before too long, we'll have to include that as another, um, another model parameter. Um, trap net lifts and the gill net lifts. So this is essentially effort for Lake Michigan. Um, it's been up and down, obviously. I mean, again, back in the 90s and early 2000s, we had that big production, had a lot of effort out there, and then it dropped considerably here. And it's starting to creep back up a little bit in recent years. Um, and gill nets um, have just kind of held their own, um, but generally declining since around 2000. Uh, catch per effort gill nets. This is this kind of more reflects what's going on um, with catchability issues. So with changes in water clarity. As a result of uh, the dry mussels and the issues with Clafra and things, the, the drop 
in catch per effort. In other words, a gill net is just not as effective as it used to be. We saw that to a certain extent on Green Bay, but because um, it doesn't suffer from the changes, the large changes in uh, primary productivity that Lake Michigan is suffering from now, you don't see as big a, a difference. So gill nets are still fairly effective, at least in the southern part of Green Bay. And the trap net uh, catch per effort has just kind of been up and down all over the board. Um, peaked at around 800, or 800 uh, pounds per lift uh, at around 2012. And now we're down to about half of that, a little less than half of that, which was kind of illustrated as well in what the spawning stock biomass is, is showing. And this is going on throughout Lake Michigan. Most of the Michigan units, state of Michigan units are experiencing these very same changes. So this is the, the same um, graph that I had shown for Green Bay, but this is average age of a whitefish um, going back to the mid 90s as opposed to 2007 when the Green Bay model starts. So essentially the black is the average age that from our ages and the uh, red is, is the model trying to, to, to fit to the data. What's important about this is a couple of things. If I was able to show one graph to, if so, to, and I was only able to choose one to show what's going on in Lake Michigan, this would be the one. You can see how things have, how dramatic things have changed. Um, being in the mid 90s, the average age of a fish harvested in the commercial fishery was five years old. Now they're upwards of 16 or 17 years old you see how the lines start to fall apart between the two. And like I talked about earlier, you st when those fish get older and bigger, you start to see a lot of more error in the age compositions. The model has a harder time fitting the data. Whereas back in the early uh, mid nineties, two thousands, there weren't a lot of year classes out there to, uh, to uh, provide for the fishery. What's also happened is the slowing of growth. Um, and I think I have, I'll have a slide about this later and we'll talk a bit more about that, about how much growth has slowed. Um, um, as an example, it takes um, about twice as long for a fish to get to 17 inches now than it did back in the mid 90s. So you had fewer year classes. Um, they were being cropped off earlier, but they were monstrous year classes. Now we have fish that are surviving out into their mid to late 20s. Um, which is amazing. In fact, if I'm remembering correctly, in the commercial fishery on Lake Michigan, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% or so that are harvested are over 20 or 25 years old. Um, so that's a, not a place we want to be. I mean, it suggests that mortality has been low over the years, but it also sh shows you how recruitment um, has not been occurring um, because this shouldn't be such a dramatic increase in the average average age of a fish out there. Here's the one I mentioned about the size at age. So this is simply looking at a few uh, age classes, four, six, eight, 10, and 12 years old, and how the bottom fell out um, in the early 2000s. So the mean weight, if you pick, um, for example, uh, like on the top there at age 12 fish, um, on, on average was seven to eight pounds in the late 90s. By the early to mid 2000s, it had dropped in half. And that's what I was talking about where these fish are, the growth has slowed so much, it's uh, taking them twice as long to get to 17 inches, which is the commercial size limit. Um, and it really hasn't improved all that much. And this is, these data I think are, this is for Lake Michigan, but it's not a lot different on Green Bay, quite frankly. <clears throat> um, so that's where I'm going to finish up with the model data and if there's something that somebody else is interested in or curious about, I've got other slides um, or I can fill you in on any other points of information. Um, so now we go into the quotas. So we're now going to determine two quotas, one for the Green Bay and one for Lake Michigan. Um, in this case, we're using a 35% exploitation rate, um, and that's not a straight 35%. It's actually 35% of the most vulnerable year class that's out there, and, that, um, and then it kind of trickles out from there. Um, it's consistent with what we used the last time we ran the model, and um, there is some concern with 
um, trying to be a little more conservative because of the Michigan trawler um, off of uh, Bark Cedar Rivers area. Um, harvests a considerable number of fish there and there's a pretty good chance a lot of those are coming from Wisconsin waters actually. Um, <clears throat> The Green Bay model data, as I mentioned earlier, are a bit limited in total of years going into the model. So as we get more years in, it'll get refined and, and uh, we'll have a, a more robust model going into this. But it's, it's not bad. It's, it's the best we could do with the data that we had because, as I mentioned, the data were just collected for one fishery, for one stock, spawning stock over the years and it wasn't until the recent years that we really started to try to focus on Lake Michigan and Green Bay and had to split our effort there. Um, and then finally the recruitment of young fish in, has been very limited in Lake Michigan proper um, as opposed to Green Bay. So these are the uh, results of the two models. Um, this is what it'll come out to and in um, uh, weight, uh, the total allowable catch for each body of water for the commercial fishery and then for the sport fishery in Green Bay. Um, the Green Bay, so as you can see, the Green Bay um, quota was split directly in half. And this is consistent with what's being done, has been done for some time with yellow perch on Green Bay between the recreational and the commercial fishery. Um, the new, uh, and then Lake Michigan dropped considerably. And so Lake Michigan uh, quota is 605,000 pounds. Um, so if you look at some of the, the text below, kind of get a feel for how things have changed. Um, the current quota that we're in right now for, that we use to, for all of Lake um, Wisconsin waters is about 2.8 million pounds. The new commercial quotas, when you tell it, when you total them all up, are about 2.96 million pounds. So it's kind of interesting how um, how the close they came out, and since the last time the quota was run. However, what's essentially been done now is the fish now that were that were uh, allowed to be caught in Lake Michigan have been shunted over to Green Bay. So it's kind of a flip flop. Um, and you can see in this next slide um, how, how much that's changed, gonna change the fishery itself. Because in zone one, which is this part here, Southern Green Bay up to about Egg Harbor, they were only allowed to harvest about 9% of the quota. So that's where most of the fish are being taken as we all know right now. Zone two wraps around Door County and that has 82%. And this is a lot of this is based on um, historical catch data. So where, where in zone two, which was the backbone of the fishery that has changed dramatically in, in the amount of fish that are caught there, uh, even though the 82% still holds, that's only 82% of the 605,000 pounds. So, um, and then down to zone three, so basically for the two fisheries that fish out of Manitowoc to Rivers and Sheboygan is again 9% down there. So that is kind of to be determined right now how that's going to all sort out with the various commercial fishers. But um, these are the data and these are the results um, for the model right now. I um, can show you kind of something interesting about this is, these are some big beta knock stocks. And again, I kind of mentioned how how, how things have fallen. We've, we've kind of been lucky that ours are starting to show a little bit of an up, uptick and probably haven't quite fallen quite as far as some of the, the other fisheries. This is the uh, model results from um, Big Bay to Knox on the northern part of Green Bay, which really is not behaving at all like the southern part of Green Bay, like our, our fisheries are. So we have to consider ourselves pretty lucky. Um, I think that's about it, unless people have questions. Chuck Bronte, question. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, okay, so it, um, yeah, just, just a quick question. The, the more I see of these long-term time series on whitefish, you see the hump, you see the decline in, 
in the last 15 years or so. But the beginning of the time series always start out almost at the same level as where you're at now, or maybe even a little lower. So what, what, what do you think was going on in the 90s and even in the 80s when you had lower CPUEs or lower stock sizes or whatever the metric was? Um, yeah, there's one, 13 right there. So yeah, I, I'm just, is, I mean, does anybody ask that question? Because um, because certainly right now looking at like this figure, it looks like you're actually ahead of the game of where you were in the '90s. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I and mean, that's a good point. We we are. I mean, the quotas were considerably lower, of course, back then. And and one of the issues that you have then is just kind of that. And and this is our data actually go back to 1990 and I think the Michigan models go back later than that into the 80s. So this is a bit of a kind of a knife edge um, start to this model. And the only, one of the only reason I couldn't go back is because I wasn't able to get through all the data, sort through and clean up all the data back to, to the early 90s. So, you know, I, I don't really know. I, I know that around 93 to 97 was kind of the meat of where Though where that big production came from, and of course it didn't take them long to to mature. I mean those fish okay. were mature like in three years or something. So okay. they really and they grew a heck of a lot faster. Sure. So, um, but you know I don't I can't really attest to the long term um, changes. You know, but but you're right. I mean it really was back in the eighties. It was the amount of uh, harvest was considerably lower. I mean yeah. Really hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, I got one one last thing. You said this total standing stock biomass in Green Bay was seven. Did you say seven million pounds? Oh, it's no, it's thirty-seven million pounds. Thirty-seven million? Yeah. My lord. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, and, and you know that that can change now. We. Like I, I mentioned, having you know less years in the data in the model, you aren't able to backcast too far with some of those year classes. But it actually covers most of the big year classes that, that came out. Two thousand three, nine, and fifteen are the biggest ones we've had. Ninety seven was a big year class, so um, it, it is impressive. But the more data, the more years we get into the model, you know, things can change. Of course, with these models. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, Bob, you got your hand up. Yes, I do. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Uh, stomach content studies. Uh, as we all know, if the fish got a lot to eat, you have a lot of fish. If the fish don't have a lot to eat, you don't have a lot of fish. Um, I had the pleasure of being called a liar in front of our Natural Resources Board by the Commercial Fishing Board when they stated that the whitefish do not eat quagga mussels. I provided three published papers from friends of mine in Michigan that said, yes, they do, and in some cases in great quantities. Are these gyrations on the uh, charts that you've got, could they be attributed perhaps to quagga mussel populations or uh, rongobi populations? Perhaps. Um, that's what we're going to find out in a number of uh, well, several years from now. So there was a, a summit of sorts a few years ago um, that Brad and I attended um, in Michigan at Michigan uh, in East Lansing um, to try to get at the issues with recruitment of Lake Whitefish uh, or the lack thereof. And there was some extra money thrown into some pots, um, one of the sources that um, I forget exactly how it was doled out, but some extra money went into the some of the typical Great Lakes um, fisheries funds that uh, researchers are able to draw from, and to look specifically at issues with recruitment of lake whitefish. So that's that's certainly one of the possibilities, and, and the timing is is pretty good there. I mean, right around the early 2000s, when things were changing in the lake in terms of water clarity. Um, the loss of diphoria as a, as a food source. All these things were happening. This coincides pretty well with what happened with whitefish here in the drop in the population. Um, Very good, thank you. 
there are a number of studies that are being proposed out there to look at this very thing. Good, thanks. Here. Jerry. Hey Scott, question for you. Um, out of curiosity, you had uh, mentioned about um, the age of the fish being a lot older, um, but not growing as fast. Mm -hmm. What is changing in your thought as far as their metabolism rate? Or I guess I'm curious, I mean, obviously a fish has to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so there must be something out there for them to live that long. They must be eating something. Um, yeah. Well, a couple of things now, as we've seen in the years, we're, we're pretty fortunate that whitefish are pretty adaptable and a plastic species. In other words, they're, you know, I, I, I think that has a lot to do with why they're, why they're being caught in Green Bay as part of the equation, because they're, they're out there foraging for whatever they can find. And they've been able to adapt to a point to the Gobi invasion. Um, some of our other um, Corrigonians have not, um, bloater chubs, for example. Um, where they feed lower on the food chain, uh, feed in different parts of the trophic system, and they're not doing nearly as well. So um, really this is most likely just a simply um, a reflection of the changes, well, two things. One of them is, and it could still be an effect, and, and, and the, one of the earlier thoughts was because those year classes in the mid-90s were so huge, so giant, that there was a density-dependent effect. In other words, so many fish for only a certain amount of food, so too much competition. And then the other thought is, of course, the changes in the trophic system as a result of the, the dreisin and mussel invasions. And they're probably both true, but it seems to me the latter is bec now becoming more of, a, more of an issue because we're not seeing the improvement in growth with the drop in population. Um, so those fish, I mean, that's a long-winded answer for the fact that they just don't have as much to eat and the quality of the food isn't there. So they're out there foraging for, as we talked about earlier, mussels, um, they're eating, they are eating more fish and then they eat the, the invertebrate um, organisms, whatever they can find. And that's really mostly what they're still feeding on is the inverts on the bottom. Um, but compared to dipariah, which was, kind of, I guess, known as a freshwater shrimp that's all but gone from Lake Michigan. Um, what they're feeding on now, it just doesn't come close to having the nutritional content that dipariah has. Dipariah were really high on lipids, um, very high energy content, and they've pretty much been wiped out from all of Lake Michigan, um, likely from the mussels. So they're, they're feeding, they're moving around, um, and they're getting enough to survive and, and, and they're getting enough for gonadal development, obviously, so that they can reproduce, but the somatic growth, the actual growth of the fish has declined precipitously. So um, essentially what I'm saying is they're getting just enough to survive. Um, we have seen in Green Bay the last couple of years though, um, much higher fat content on the fish, much more robust fish the last couple of years coming out of Green Bay, which is, is nice to see. All right, thanks, Scott. Yep. Um, so that uh, that really uh, that's the end of our uh, what we had planned here for today. Um, I guess we can. Uh, if anyone has any questions, um, otherwise we can uh, say good night. Any other questions? Where we go. All right, hearing none. Um, thanks, everybody. I will uh, uh, get these notes out uh, as soon as possible, and uh, we'll uh, uh, talk again in the future. Thanks, Titus. Thanks, Titus. Thanks, yep. Titus. Titus, can you hear me yet? Yeah. Yeah, how can I get a copy of that recording? Or can you email that to me? I will let you know. I gotta I haven't uh